Uh, this is part number three of a study that we have entitled The Doctrine of Israel's Remnant. Uh, I was tempted because of the, the many questions that uh, came up afterwards uh, to, to just simply put the, this aside and to go back to the study that we had. Uh, but um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm going to wait a little bit to do that. And the reason I'm going to wait is because I'm going to think this thing through just a little bit because I had some questions regarding rules and exceptions to the rule and exceptions to the exceptions of what do I do here and so forth. And surely there has to be some sort of a principle or principles to cover this. And so let me think this through and, and we'll do that. Uh, also, uh, with regard to that, um, I'm really burdened uh, to do a couple of things. One is um, it, it excites me that people are interested in thinking in doctrinal terms. I, that just, I'm just excited. Uh, that in no way, please uh, don't ever think that I would be discouraged by asking a question. It shows that you are thinking and, uh, and thinking on how to apply this. And so uh, that's that's great. Let's let's keep that up because that's how we learn and grow and so forth. And that's what it's all about. I, I am burdened that we that we move on to to the to, to a next level of advanced doctrine. And I would like to uh, sometimes my, my time just runs out physically. I just cannot do it all. But I would like to uh, make sure that all of our studies are in print and that we have illustrations just like the ones you have uh, before you there. And um, one is, uh, of course, I think it's chart uh, nine, is the doctrine of uh, the remnant or the illustration of what the remnant is. We'll just take a, a minute and look at that. We will get to that later on. We have discussed it uh, with my pitiful stick drawings, but then the second one is a doctrine that is in the Bible, but is distinctively and decidedly our own here. Uh, no one else puts a third segment in the overall concept of the remnant. And uh, it is applicable in the dispensation of grace. It's applicable in the dispensation of law. Uh, that there is a group of undecided people that can go either way. And so we call it the fluid thirds because there can be an addition or a subtraction to the group. Of course, with the exception being, if you take the mark and join the majority, you cannot get out of that. That's, that's uh, set. On the back part uh, are two illustrations uh, that um, I have had the permission to use from a friend, and uh, they are uh, drawings on the ceiling of the 144,000 and, uh, and also on the uh, 12 tribes uh, times 12,000, indicating 144,000, because we're going to be getting into that with regard to what they do. Why in the world is there th this group? And I guarantee you, there is not another church on this planet, including grace churches, that has ever figured out, uh, and we say that to God's glory, that has ever figured out that they are 144,000 males who are, 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 have been set apart, genetically certified, their pedigree is of God himself, to start the Hebrew race all over again with uh, fulfilling the multiplication clause in the Abrahamic uh, um, covenant. So please pray that I'm able to put these things in writing for all of us. Eventually we will be able to share them with others. And one of the reasons that uh, I, I don't want necessarily that you give them to, to others, if you need to use them to share them with others, that's fine. If others want them, they can write them on a great, uh, and write me and I'll have them on a grace basis. I just don't want them to become cheap. And that's often what happens. You know, you get a handout from somebody and you crumple it up and there it goes. And, uh, uh, these studies are worth more than that. We want them to be um, respected. Okay, now uh, we covered some territory generally with regard to Israel's remnant. And uh, we're heading toward the time when the remnant will be in existence. By the way, um, I don't know if, if you know it or not, but it, it's a remnant that is taken from around the whole world as such. 
There are 12,000 from each tribe, from the earth and from among men. And uh, it is quite possible, we're talking about extrapolation, it is quite possible that our ministry here, your life, can impact one of, one of those beings. It is possible. We're living this side of the tribulation period. And, uh, and there are going to be things we're going to leave behind that will flow out to those people after the rapture. And so please keep that in mind. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if uh, uh, your life uh, was such that God used it through all of the courses of history to touch that one guy who was of the tribe of Judah or, or what have you. I guess uh, you'd be responsible for having a, a son in the faith. And remember, his, um, his express duty is to multiply Israel. So you have a whole lot of grandchildren. Okay, keep that in mind. Spiritual grandchildren, that is. Listings of the tribes of Israel. Before we can know the remnant and the importance of the remnant, we have got to know Israel's tribes. Now the problem with that is, is that they're listed in various ways in Scripture and all of these ways are not necessarily consistent. And we're going to have to see why this is so before we move on to the remnant. Because once we get to the ceiling of the 144,000, there are some tribes that are deleted. Some tribes that are taken out of the list. Others added. Uh, and by the time we get to the end, there are going to be 13 tribes of Israel. How did that happen? Well, we'll tell you. Chapter... Uh, 29 in Genesis. One of the first listings of Israel's tribes comes by way of their birth order. And so we have them listed here. Verse number 32. Leah conceived, bare a son, called his name Reuben. Verse 33, last part of the verse, she called his name Simeon. This is Leah, uh, Leah again. Uh, then the third son, his name is called Levi. Fourth son, his name is called Judah. All right, then she quit bearing. This four straight years where she has had a child. Bless her little heart. But now we... Uh, Rachel saw that this happened, and she was barren. So she gave to Jacob her handmaid, Bilhah, verse 3 of chapter 30. He went into her and had a son, verse number 6. She called his name Dan. Bilhah again conceived, second straight year. Last part of verse 8, she called his name uh, Naphtali. All right, so uh, Leah says, okay, well, uh, I need to take a rest, and since... Uh, Rachel gave her handmaid, I'll just give him my handmaid, Zilpah. So when Leah saw, verse 9, that she had left bearing, she took Zilpah, gave her to Jacob to wife. And uh, gay, verse number 11 says, uh, A troop cometh, and she called his name Gad. And uh, this is, of course, I've mentioned this several, several times before, that this is the favorite name of all of them, just because it's so outlandish. Of course, in the Hebrew, it means the troop cometh. Uh, so there's nothing bad about that. All right, last part of verse 13, Zilpah's next son is Asher. So Leah decides that uh, she needs to get uh, back uh, in the game, as it were. So she's going to have two more sons. Verse number 18, she called his name Issachar. Last part of verse number 20, she called his name Zebulun. Now, finally, Rachel prays a prayer. And this prayer was, Lord, you know, give me children lest I die. You have to remember that the type of mentality, the t type of economy, the type of promises that God gave to Israel. They were interested in multiplying seed. And, uh, and of course, that comes from the perspective of the woman. She wants to bear children for a husband. And so in, in this uh, particular case, that's why she prayed this prayer. And then next, that the Messiah would come through uh, their line. So they were, they were praying for that, that the next child might possibly be the Messiah for Israel that was promised. So she prayed that prayer. 
Now, uh, Rachel, therefore, was blessed of God. He opened her womb, verse 22. She conceived and bore a son. Verse 24 says, she called his name Joseph. Now turn to chapter 35, because it's here that we have the final son of Israel. And that's in verse number 18. And it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died at his birth. She called his name Benani, but his father called him Benjamin. All right. So let's just take a look at these 12 again. These men are 12 of the most important men of all history for Israel. Actually, they're important for us too. Why? Because Jesus Christ came from one of these tribes. And had any of these men uh, failed, as it were, to live up to, to their, their part with regard to prophecy, and some of them are going to fail, you'll, you'll see. But they end up making amends for their failures. Uh, Jesus Christ came through Judah. He's the line of the tribe of Judah. And therefore, our common Savior with the Jews is linked to the fact that we owe this man a debt of, of gratitude, that he was born and that he fathered uh, other uh, children that eventually would impact our lives. For without Judah, we would have no Savior. And Judah, of course, his name means uh, praised uh, one or the one that brings praise or what have you. Uh, and uh, Jesus Christ is the um, one that brings praise and glory to God the Father. So all of these men are very, very important as far as the plan and program of God are concerned. Every single man here bore children that the promise of God is directly related to with regard to preservation and multiplication. Now let me go back and say that again. The angelic conflict you know, with us, it's somewhat a little easier because in the dispensation of grace, it's more individual than national or family. But under the dispensation of law, you had household salvation. You had individual men standing or representing groups of people. And, uh, and that meant something with regard to, to salvation. If, um, if God did not preserve the line of any of these, he could, would not keep his promise. If any of the seed of any of these men died off, he would not have preserved them, and thus he could not multiply them, and Lucifer wins the angelic conflict on, on earth. And that's why when it comes to the tribulation period, guess why when Lucifer is cast out on the earth, that it is said that Antichrist makes war with the what? the saints, the remnant of Israel's seed. Lucifer is cast out on the earth and he gets mad. Why? His time is short. So who does he attack? The remnant of the seed of the woman. He makes war with a, see, because he's trying to annihilate the seed. If he can just get one tribe not to be represented in the millennial kingdom, if he can annihilate one whole tribe, he wins. And that's why the focus of his attention is to get the Jews into his kingdom with the mark that disqualifies them or to just simply kill off the remnant of the seed of Israel. So these men are important. The next way they're listed is uh, with their moms. Verse number 23. The sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun. So Leah bore six sons to, um, to Jacob. Uh, there, are, as we said, there are some pretty important sons here. We've already mentioned Judah. The next son, the third in line, was Levi. Why is he important? Because he, from his family, is going to come the national priesthood of Israel. He, his family is going to represent a whole nation to the Lord Jesus Christ through the means of the tabernacle and then ultimately the temple. Evidently, to the, the millennial temple, their priesthood is reinstated. 
And uh, that's why it's not wrong whenever we um, hear people named Levi, we should praise the Lord. That means there's one Jew uh, from which or from whose family um, God can reinstate the priesthood or a Kohen. That's, a, that's another good Jewish name related to the priesthood. Then it says, Rachel, the sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin. Now he lists uh, in the scriptures these two women first. Why? Because these are the two women that Jacob worked for. Now, mind you, this is just a little by the by, all right, with regard to, uh, to uh, marriage in the Old Testament and why sometimes we need to rethink some of the concepts that uh, fundamentalist Christianity has, uh, has uh, corrupted with regard to this. When, when Jacob first, first uh, uh, got married, he thought he was going to get married to whom? <laughs> he, he didn't even like Leah. <laughs> but the custom was, he got married according to custom. And that was that the older sister went, went first. Now remember, he had already put in seven years of, of hard labor for, for this gal. And then uh, it comes the, the, the day of the wedding and she takes off her veil and said, whoa, wait one second. This was, this was not, this was not the gal that I was working for. Oh yeah, oh, didn't I tell you, says Uncle Laban, uh, in, uh, in our country, the oldest sister goes first. If she's not married, the, the, the next in line can't get married. So he worked seven more years for Rachel, which is the, the one that, uh, that he loved. Now, then I want you to note, Bilhah and Zilpah were simply handmaids. Uh, they enter the picture because Leah and Rachel were having a sisterly fight here about, well, you got more kids than I got. Okay, fine. Take my handmaid and we'll raise them up there. We'll see how many we can get Jacob through the, these two. And so that's how the, the uh, 12 tribes of Israel came about. Let's read it. Verse number 25. Bilhah, Rachel's handmaid, Dan and Naphtali. Zilpah, Leah's handmaid, Gad and Asher. So here are all the sons of uh, Israel. Now, however, we've got to make another study here. Turn with me to Numbers chapter 1. Numbers chapter 1. It's here that we find A difference, a lot of history has happened between these two numberings and the third numbering of Israel. Now, what history has happened? These guys here of the, the 12, especially uh, the first 10, Benjamin was too young uh, to join in with them, decided that uh, Joseph was too much of a dreamer and he was the father's pet. And he was, there's no doubt about it. Jacob loved Joseph. Now, why did Jacob love Joseph a little better than he loved all the rest? It was Rachel's firstborn. And who did he love of all these women? He loved Rachel the most. Now he loved all of his kids. Don't misunderstand me. He loved each and every one of them. Uh, but because his heart was set for Rachel, and Rachel had gone through all of these births, so she was the last one to give birth, um, therefore, he really loved Joseph, and he gave him the coat of many colors. Now, uh, it wasn't the, what do they call that, the, the Technicolor dream coat or whatever, uh, dream coat, yeah, the Technicolor dream coat. Uh, it, it wasn't that. But it was a symbol of a couple things. One, in, in actuality, inheritance and most favored status. <laughs> you, he was the most favored son. And so the rest of them got a little bit angry. And so they were going to kill him off. But instead, they sold him into slavery in Egypt. And he turns out to be a head over the whole empire next to Pharaoh himself. And he saved the whole kit and caboodle of the bunch. And as a result of that, because he was savior of the world, as it were, and especially of the line of the rest of the tribes of Israel that have starved out. God did something special for, for Joseph. 
And that wa uh, was he uh, inserted two of Joseph's sons, as we'll see, into the line of the 12 tribes of Israel. He removed Joseph's name and inserted the name of his firstborn son, Ephraim, and his second son, Manasseh. All right, there's something else that God is going to do, as we'll see. Gad is going to get a promotion. Levi's name is going to be removed from the 12 tribes, and the name of Gad is going to be reinstated. Levi is going to become a 13th tribe, as it were, not numbered amongst the 12 as such, but for purposes of convention, we're going to have to make him number 13. His name means one that is joined or one that is attached to the 12. He has a special uh, designation because he has a special function as a tribe. All right, let's look here then as they're listed. Verse 20, the children of Reuben, Israel's eldest. Verse 22, the children of Simeon. Verse 24, here's where we find it, the children of Gad. Verse 26, the children of Judah. Verse 28, the children of Issachar. Verse 30, the children of Zebulun. Verse um, 32, of the children of Joseph, namely uh, the children of Ephraim, and then verse 34, of the children of Manasseh. Now this is, this is an important change here. There, there are three important changes as we, we have it. Uh, this order, as it said, well, if you look at them, um, at uh, verse number 18 in, in chapter 1 here. They assembled all the congregation together on the first day of the second month, and they declared their pedigree after their families by the house of their fathers according to the number of their names. So they're listed by pedigree here. Uh, but we're going to have an, a marching order. There are, there are a lot of other things that, that are important uh, in this list. Uh, we'll discuss those later. Let's move on. Verse 36. The children of Benjamin, the children of Dan, verse 38, verse 40, the children of Asher, verse 42, the children of uh, Naphtali. Now, if um, you look at verse number 44, we'll read these. These are those that were numbered, which Moses and Aaron numbered, and the princes of Israel being 12 men. Each one was for the house of his fathers. Now, we're seeing again the importance of God documenting pedigree for Israel. Why? I'm going to multiply your seed, Abraham. It's got to be your seed through the line of Isaac, through the line of Jacob, through the line of 12 men. They've got to come here or else I'm saying that I can preserve their seed forever. Therefore, there always has to be representatives of Israel alive on earth from this time forward, representatives of the 12 tribes. And then the, the added 13th. He's going to preserve their seed. All right. Verse 47. The Levites, after the tribe of their fathers, were not numbered among them. For the Lord had spoken to, to Moses, saying, Only thou shalt not number the tribe of Levi, neither take the sum of them among the children of Israel, but you'll appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of testimony and over all the vessels uh, thereof. So now we have another extremely important line. Not only has God obligated himself for 12 tribes, he's now added another one. Yeah. God is a glutton for punishment for some reason. I mean, you, you think that 12 would be plenty for him to do, but now he's got a 13th. And uh, descendants from all of these 13 men must be kept alive forever. Now, it doesn't mean all of the descendants. It just uh, simply means uh, um, those believing descendants, as we'll see. We're going to run out of time here in just a bit. So before we do that, we still have enough time to go to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation. Chapter 
chapter 7. Now, the tribal listings of the nation of Israel. Uh, by the way, there are others that we could uh, um, list, but these uh, these will suffice to show us some of the differences and, and so forth. We don't want to go on and on all day about this. But in Revelation chapter 7, we have another listing of Israel. And what is interesting with regard to, um, to this list is a change again of a couple of names added to the tribes. Let's look at them and say, well, there's another uh, change here. Let, let's just uh, note it as we go. Revelation chapter 7, let's go to verse 1. And by the way, as you are uh, doing this, you can turn to chart number 11. Chart number 11. Where it has the sealing of God. The sealing of God on the 144,000. Now, as I say this, there are actually two seals that we're going to study on, on these men. And the place of both seals is mentioned in the Bible. And it's, a, it's really a, a study in and of it itself, but I'm going to mention it. We will get back to it and mention it a little more and, and uh, go into as much detail as possible later on. Where are the two seals on these 144,000 believing Jews? One is going to be on their forehead, and the other is going to be on their foreskin. They're going to be circumcised. So they're going to have a mark on their forehead and a mark on their foreskin. That's what circumcision is. Now, what does that designate? Uh, again, every, every time a Jew had sex, uh, this, this is actually what the circumcision is designed for, to be a re reminder of two things. God has uh, uh, promised to preserve and multiply the seed of Israel. Uh, he didn't just do that because uh, God was anxious and marking up uh, uh, the bodies of all these Jewish men, but it was a seal that these men had the potential of fulfilling the promises of God. He's going to keep them alive. They're procreating. For what reason? Because God said, I'm always going to have one of your seed alive on the earth. And the seal in their forehead means that they believed in the Lord. He sanctions them and sanctions their pedigree. They are actually who they are in these, in these tribes. It's important because these men here are going to keep alive Israel along with some others. After these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, or any tree. Another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And by the way, there is, um, there is one of these, the guys that are sealed there in the picture. Uh, he, he looks a little feminine, and his hair is a little long. Uh, uh, we'll pretend that's not a girl, even though it looks like one. Uh, we'll pretend it's not. Um, the seal of the living God. Don't hurt the earth, the sea, the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now, mind you, all of these men have already been sealed in their foreskins. They have already been circumcised and linked to the covenant of, of Israel. Now they are believers and included in an elite group. That elite group is going to begin the multiplication process of Israel. And they're called, it's interesting, uh, uh, servants, um, servants of, uh, uh, of God. 
that's a difficult job. I guess somebody had to be chosen to do that. And that's multiply Israel. And so these guys are chosen. I heard the number of them which were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of the children of Israel. And so now we go on with the list. First change. And the tribe of Judah. Now why is this extremely important? Because Judah was... Jacob's firstborn and the law of primogeniture demands that the firstborn get the inheritance rights. Unless, of course, you're like Esau, who sold it for a pot of beans and Jacob, the supplanter, got it. But in this case, Reuben was disqualified because um, of his, of his um, uh, sexual failure. He was demoted. Judah, because of the spiritual successes he brought praise through Jesus Christ. Now we have Reuben. Now we have Gad. Now we have Asher. Uh, Naphtali, difference in the Greek uh, uh, representations. Manasseh, Simeon. Now I want you to note this. Verse number seven. Levi's added. Why is Levi added? because the tribe of Dan is omitted. You will not find the tribe of Dan here. Now, why in the world would God go through all of these great lengths to preserve all these guys, take Levi out in the first place, make him 13, and now they're going to go, by, uh, uh, go back and take Dan out and put Levi, reinstate him, so that uh, these 12 tribes are there. What, um, for what reason? We'll see in just a second. Let's go back and Note, Issachar is mentioned, uh, Zebulun is mentioned, Joseph is now reinstated. Now remember the third listing we had, his two sons were there. The name of his son Ephraim was inserted rather than Joseph. Now Joseph is back in the lineup. Then Benjamin, and you'll note, Dan is omitted from this list. All right, let's look at what happened. Turn with me to Deuteronomy. Chapter 29. Now here's what's um, happened. Dan and Ephraim had a tendency toward idolatry. And God gave a specific warning to people with regard to their name and their tribe with regard to idolatry. And Ephraim, and then especially Dan, were influential in leading the other tribes astray. Now, it's not that all of them didn't deserve to be omitted from the list, but it's just in a special case, these two were listed. Uh, let's, we just have time to look at the prohibition tonight. We'll see exactly what it was these did to get their names omitted from the list, at least temporarily. They will be reinstated. Verse 9. Keep therefore the words of this covenant and do them, that ye might prosper in all that ye do. Ye stand this day, all of you, before the Lord, the captains of your tribes, elders, officers of all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, stranger in their camp, and so forth, that you should enter into the covenant of the Lord, into his oath he's making with you this day, that he might establish you today for a people unto himself. Again, preservation, multiplication. I'm entering into this oath because I've got to keep you alive. However, there... God is going to have a part. Man is going to have a part. All right. What oath was it that he might establish for uh, them for a people as he had sworn unto Abraham, Isaac and Jacob? Neither with you only do I make this covenant, this oath, but with him that standeth uh, uh, here with us this day before the Lord and also with him that is not here with us this day. 
Now, what is that? I've made a covenant with your fathers. Now, here we are through the Egyptian uh, 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 bondage. Now, 40 years uh, later, we're making another covenant. I just want to remind you of this, that I'm going to uh, uh, preserve you. And then with the children that you're going to have, they're not here today, but they will be here because I'm going to preserve your race. The oath goes from the time I made it forever. But verse number 17, uh, 16 Ye know how you've dwelt in the land of Egypt and how you came through the nations which ye passed by. You've seen their abominations, idols, wood, stone, gold, which were among them. Lest there be among you a man, woman, family, tribe. Now please note that. God is saying here, wait one second. I I'm going to do this, but there's something you've got to do on your part. There is a warning. There is a danger. A man, woman, family, or tribe whose heart turns away this day from the Lord and go and serve other gods, what's going to happen? Well, verse 20, the Lord will not spare him. And then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man. All the curses of this book written, uh, uh, all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him. And the Lord shall blot out his name from under heaven. Note verse 21. And the Lord shall separate him unto evil out of all the tribes of Israel. So as we're bringing this part to a close, we'll see it tonight. This is exactly what happened to two men. God came to the point of the tribulation uh, period and because of their tendency toward idolatry and leading others toward idolatry, what would be the main idolatry in the tribulation period? The worship of Antichrist in his image, taking his mark. And so what God did was simply reinsert the tribe of Levi and omit the tribe of Dan, take away the name of Ephraim and reinsert the name of Joseph. Uh, because that's what the promise was. You, you go into idolatry, you lead others, I'm going to separate you, blot out your name, or I'll, I'll separate the tribe from among the others in Israel. And so here is the way that it stands, uh, or will stand, when the 144,000 are sealed. Point. God... Um, did, we'll see that Dan did make it, but God did not preserve his seed. His seed is going to be there, and I'll show you how we know that, in the millennium. But at this point, God simply um, took the law that we just read and omitted his name and did not promise through the tribulation period to preserve the seed of Dan for their um, blatant idolatry like to have every head to be bowed and every eye closed. Significance of this study to us. Jesus Christ, because of his faithfulness to the Lord, was given a name which is above every name that is there to give us incentive because there are other names that can be earned under the delegated authority of Jesus Christ. Demon was being cast out of a man by some Jews who didn't know much about it. The demon said, Jesus, I know, I know his name. Paul, I know, he, was, they, he respected them. But you, I don't know, didn't know his name. He was a very unimportant and inconsequential. To remove the name of Ephraim and to remove the name and the tribe of Dan means that God uh, uh, means business with regard to this. He will reinstate the names or give that blessing to those who deserve it and he will take away the name of those who don't. You can have one of those names that's above every name. Not the name of Jesus Christ, of course, but one name of his delegated authority. There's a price to be paid, there's sacrifice to be made, but you can have it if you want it. 
You'd say, Pastor, I can see that this morning with, um, with these studies. Please pray for me that I will maintain my motivation to get that name. Would you raise your hand? Anyone else? Thank you. Put them down. Lord, we are highly motivated to be part of that group. Help us not to maintain status quo, but to press on toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There are rewards to be earned. There is glory to be won for you. We pray that our lives might count. Help us not to be like that of Dan and Ephraim, but to be faithful to our calling in the name of our Savior. Amen. Or they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountain upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon the face of the earth, and none did search for them, and, and so forth. Verse number 10, therefore he says, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand, and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more, for I will deliver my flock from their mouth, that they may not be meat for them. In other words, for true believers, God is always going to provide a true shepherd eventually to give them what they need, and that's spiritual food. One last verse here, Joel chapter 1, verse 18. What happens when the sheep do not get spiritual food and go their own way. The pastor doesn't get fed. God forbid. I think that's a worse sin. Just joking, just joking. Verse 18 of Joel. How do the beasts groan? It's referring to cattle in general, herds in general, flocks in general. The herds of the cattle are perplexed. Why? Because they have no pasture. Now what happens when there is shepherd malfunction, the sheep don't get fed? Or what happens when the sheep lose their way and cannot find pasture? They simply reject the authority of their shepherd and go their own way. Well, what happens is they begin to waste away. They begin to die. There's a spiritual application there, and that's exactly what's said here. When you have no pasture, yea, the flocks of the sheep are made desolate. When the sheep is lost and not part of the flock, the shepherd cannot benefit from that sheep. When the sheep is gone, uh, gone uh, and uh, someone else steals it away, the pastor, the shepherd, cannot benefit materially from that sheep and selling the wool and, and so forth. So it's real important for all of us to understand. And I wish um, here, here I'm talking to a group of people that are, are the faithful few are the hardcore uh, believers who would be here uh, come hell or high water. Uh, and yet, and yet I wish the whole congregation were here simply because we all need to do our part. That's the only way that, that it dovetails. That's the only way that it works and functions to the glory of God.